this world there are two kingdoms, the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God. In this kingdom of God, we learn how to prepare for the next, last, and greatest awakening revival. Two trees stood in the garden. Each gave us a choice. The tree of rebellion is the kingdom of man, but the tree of life is Jesus' land. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Exploring Jesus Land. I am your host, Pastor Kevin Neville, and uh, you're joining us right in the middle of season two, or almost halfway through season two, as we're talking um, about the book that's being written called Jesus Land, which is talking about the kingdom of God. Um, the, the tagline for the book is how to prepare for the next, last, and greatest awakening which I believe God is going to be doing uh, a great awakening, just like we saw with the Finney Revival, just like we saw um, with the first great awakening. Um, and he's going to be doing it through the church as we understand how to live um, in the kingdom of God. And, and, and the book is talking about four different areas of immigration into the kingdom of God. Um, and that is the hostile foreigner, the broken immigrant, the loyal citizen, and the passionate ambassador. And what each one is and how and we find ourselves. Where do we find ourselves and what do we do about it? And so this whole season two um, is exploring the first part, which is the hostile foreigner. And we're talking about two kingdoms that we have a choice. So Adam and Eve, two kingdoms we have a choice in. At the beginning, in Adam and Eve, with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, um, there was only one kingdom. It was the kingdom of God. And it was the place where God's will holds sway. And we talked last week about what is God's will. And we talked about the word parakoresis, which was the love relationship that the Father has with the Son, who has with the Spirit. The circular dance. Parakoresis is talking about this kind of a circular dance. Uh, love relationship. How God created us in His image and invited us up into that love and that was his will now we didn't become god we stayed us he stayed him but we were invited into that love relationship with him because god is love um and that's the way he designed it and we see these beautiful motifs of god walking with adam and eve in the garden and it was a time of love and in full relationship with god and out of that came worship and out of that came obedience well, kingdom is actually the place where the king's will holds sway. The dominion of the king. And dominion could be described as the place where the king's will is. But now God gave humanity authority on the earth. Therefore, he gave them. They were made in his image. God has the power of choice. Um, and God gave humanity authority to make those choices. Because love calls for choice. Um, so last week we talked about the will of God, which is the foundation of the kingdom of God. But now we're going to see the, the kingdom of man usurp the kingdom of God because he gave us authority to make that choice and we made that choice. And that choice was for all will to, to hold sway. And because of that, the kingdom of God doesn't dis, dis exist because God is, you know, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Um, but however, we didn't have a choice anymore. We had the kingdom of man. We had no choice to return to the kingdom of God because of sin, and the punishment of sin is death. So there was only one kingdom on this earth, the kingdom of man. So it went from being one kingdom, the kingdom of God on this earth, one kingdom, the kingdom of man, and that should have been the end. God should have said, okay, we'll let them live and die, or even wipe us all out, start again, he could have. But love called for a rescue plan. And that's what the Old Testament is looking. But right now we are caught, we are part of the kingdom of man at this point of the story. And that is hostile to the things of God. Romans 8 says that the mind um, of this world, the mind apart from Christ, is hostile to the things of God. We're foreigners to the kingdom of God. And that makes us hostile foreigners. Um, so last week we talked about the will of God that made the kingdom of God. What is the will of man, mankind, that makes the kingdom of mankind? 
And that's what we're going to talk about today, chapter 13, called The Power of Choice. We're going to begin with the quote that I've said many times before. We'll say it many again. It's one of the thesis statements of the book. The greatest gift God gave humanity, other than the blood of Jesus, is the power of choice. And we're going to get into it to see that the blood of Jesus was given, the greatest gift God gave humanity. The reason it was given was why. So once again, just like they had in the Garden of Eden, we would have the power of choice. The blood of Jesus ushered in a place where we again can choose the will of God or our own will. Now, Joshua knew this power of choice when he advised the people entering the promised land. Um, they were coming in, finally getting everything God had for them, everything he had promised through Abraham and through Moses and through this whole um, season of waiting. In Joshua twenty four fifteen, as they're entering, he says, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day, who you will serve, whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites whose lands you are living in, living, our gods of our own creation, our gods um, of our own will, the will of man, mankind. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So what Joshua is doing is saying, I am choosing, my household is choosing, the will of God. You choose. The choice to follow God's will was well, not an easy one. It requires a proverbial leap of faith and a trust in God. It's quite literally proverbial because we're going to read from Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways, submit. To him, this is this, this choice you're making in the kingdom of God is a submission to him. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Choose his will over your will is a submission. We are called in the kingdom of God to submit. We're going to find out later we're also called to submit one to another. That's part of what this love is. Um. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Um, again, that's choosing his will over ours. The choice is the same that Adam and Eve had in the garden. It's quite literally the choice between life and death. We saw the choice between the two trees, the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which eating from it was rebellion from God, the punishment of which is the action of which is sin, the punishment of which is death. Life or death. Um, and we see that explained even further. You know, I lay before you life or death. Choose life. Um, and we're going to see that the choice is the same Adam and Eve had in the garden, quite literally, life or death, in Deuteronomy 30.19. Um, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you. So we're seeing this whole cosmic display. Kingdom of heaven is up there. The kingdom of man is on earth. Though the witnesses against you, because God is setting before you life or death, blessing or curse. So let me read that again. Deuteronomy 30, 19. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Now, choose life so that you and your children may live. This choice will be a lifestyle choice. It's not just a one-time choice. So often we talk about the, the sinner's prayer or the prayer of salvation. It's just one time you make this choice, the choice is done. But the choice is a continual calling to live that choice. Um, not just a one-time thing. It's a choice to immigrate to and to live in a different kingdom entirely than the one we are born into. 
Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these things will be given to you as well. When you choose life, you choose blessing. Um, that reflects Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, when he says, Submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You have everything you need in this new kingdom. And that would be blessings. Um, we don't do it because we want all these things, and that's a means to the end. We do this, and we see that in that, we have all the blessings that God created us to have, uh, which is not cars and houses and, and, and great bank accounts. And it's great if you get those and you can be blessed to it. But oftentimes, that will be the cart being put before the horse. Paul says, I've had great riches. I've had nothing. It's all good. Nothing is, is greater than surpassing love of being in Christ. So why did God give us this choice in the first place? It seemed kind of messy. You know, why didn't God just, he wants this paracoresis relationship. Why didn't he create a, 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 a creation that was predestined to choose him? Um, to choose that love relationship, he could love it. Why Why go through all of this and to think, well, it doesn't cost him anything to do it? Well, it did. You know, when we look at Jesus, what did it cost him? You know, think of Thanos. You know, what did it cost you? It cost me everything. <laughs> you know, um, right here we see why did God put himself in that position? You know, give us that choice in the first place. Well, let's review what we set up as foundational. That only choice could lead to a genuine love. We talked about the paracoresis relationship last week, whether it's the father loves the son that loves the spirit, who loves the father. We're invited into this, into this love. We're invited into it. That's the key point. We are not made to come into it. This is the way we're made to be, but we're not forced into it. We, are, we get to choose. Will you come? I will be your God. You will be my people. I'll be your father. You'll be my sons and daughters. We want you into this love relationship. Will you come? And that is the foundation of what love is. That only choice could lead to genuine love relationship. However, to truly understand this and to actually live in it, we must both, both understand and experience God's love for us first. So in other words, until we are in this love relationship with God, we can't have this love that God wants us to share with, with others. God chose you even though it might have seemed maybe not the smartest choice. Why did God choose you? Why did God do this? That doesn't seem like a very smart choice, especially since Adam and Eve did what they did. God, you could have saved yourself all that trouble. That's not a very smart choice you made. But 1 Corinthians one twenty seven says, But God choose, chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. Why did God choose to love me and give me choice? And have that relationship? Well, sometimes he seems to have chosen the foolish things, but for his own purpose and will. He made this choice for you even before you were created. So it wasn't just a spontaneous choice he made. Uh, I wish I didn't make this. No, even before you were created, he knew he was going to give you these choices. He knew he was giving Adam and Eve, but you also, the power of these choices. 1 Corinthians one twenty seven, but God, oh, I read that. Ephesians 1, 3 to 4, Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realm with every spiritual bless blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love. When you say that's a verse about predestination, no, 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 let's, let's put that aside. This is his will for you. He wanted you and has called you and has chosen you before the foundation of the world that he wants you to be holy and blameless in his sight as a citizen of the kingdom of God in love brought into this paracoresis relationship. And this choice wasn't just to save you, but to bring you into his own kingdom in honor. First Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness, the kingdom of man, 
into his wonderful light, wondrous light, kingdom of God. Perichoresis is a relationship of being invited into the love of God, and this is his will for all mankind. However, the kingdom of man rose up when humanity chose their own will instead. So what does God what is God's choice then? The greatest gift God gave us, other than the blood of Jesus, was the power of choice. And the blood of Jesus was given so we again could have the power of choice. We're made in God's image. As he made us, it's because of who he is. So God himself, obviously, has choice. And what was God's choice? Was it to let us go down to death because of the choice we made? He could have. Some may argue he should have. That would have been the wise choice. Nice and easy. Wipe them out, start again. Wipe them out. They chose. Choice is made. Justice is done. Nice and clean. Earth could have been formless and void again. He could have created it back out. Given another species another choice. There would have been a mercy, some would say. And, and you can kind of look at the flood and say, well, that almost happened at the flood. Um, but through it, he saved Noah and his family. Um, and, and if he didn't, just think Noah and his family, if it wasn't for them, he could have just wiped them, everybody out, started again, and he wouldn't have to have gone to the cross. He wouldn't have to have gone through that suffering. He could have simply started again. So why didn't he? Remember what his will is. He saved humanity and gave us the power of choice because he was being faithful to his own will. And that was love. What would you do for somebody you loved? Would you go through all that for somebody you loved? The cross and the resurrection reset our choice. He shed his blood to make our immigration possible to enter the kingdom of God. Returning the kingdom of God to this earth because we had a choice. We had the king. He was in the midst of us. He was, the kingdom of, of God is in the midst of us. It's in us. It's in our midst. And we talked about that in season one. Um... But he shed his blood to make our immigration possible to enter the kingdom of God and his resurrection to return to the kingdom of God to this earth in all of its authority. We see this in the salvation journey. Romans 10, 9 says, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is sort of the premise of the salvation prayer. I'm saying that if you say it, Jesus is Lord, you're making that declaration, you believe it in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Um, when we pray this, we are making a choice. And so often we kind of get the concept where if you just pray, you ask Jesus to be your Savior, your personal Savior, who will forgive your sins, if you ask forgiveness for your sins, and that's done. But what the salvation prayer really is, is just a verbal response to making a choice to immigrate, to begin a different lifestyle with a different Lord in a different kingdom and submitting your will so it begins there, but it keeps going. We're going to do a chapter next season called The Journey of a Thousand Miles um, that's going to really talk about that. When we pray, what we saw in Romans 10, 9, we are making a choice, not just that Jesus will be our Savior, but that he will also be our Lord. We're choosing him to be our King. And this is the big difference. A lot of people will say, oh, I'm okay with him being my Savior, but I want to remain my Lord. I want to honor him with my lips, but my heart is far from him. I want him to be my God, but I still want to hoard my will and my, um, I don't want to put my submission under anybody. And that, that's the problem we have with the church, that we say it with our lips, but in our actions, we want to keep our own will. And that's not what he's called us to. The choice is not just an emotion of salvation. It's entering into his kingdom and his will. We return to the place where the king's will hold sway. And our choice re remains the same as Adam and Eve. His will, tree of life. Our will, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What were his will 
produce in our life now if we choose it? What will the consequences be of choosing his will? Well, first of all, we, we know that it's his desire that all humanity make this choice um, for his love. First Timothy uh, 2, 3 to 4 tells us that. It's God's will that all be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Um, his will would lead you to the process of sanctification. Uh, we talk about going from you know the hostile foreigner to the broken immigrant to the loyal citizen to the passionate ambassador. But really, that is just another way of saying we are being made into the image of Christ because this is who Christ, Jesus was. He was you know, a loyal citizen of God. Uh, he's the king. But he showed us the way on the earth, saying, not my will, but your will be done. He was a passionate ambassador for God. He had that passion. Um, we even talk about the cross of resurrection being the passion the, the, the whole week. Um, so he showed us the way, even though he himself was the king. Um, we call that sanctification. You know, we are saved. We are in the, in the kingdom of God. But there's a process where we're being made into the image of God, which our mind is changing. We're getting the mind of Christ. We're getting to the habits of Christ. We're getting the heart of Christ. We're getting that passion to be called to go out into the whole world and preach the gospel. And that's the process. process of sanctification is the process of being made in the image of Christ. Being made to call further and further into the kingdom of God. Um, this is growth in your citizenship in the kingdom of God as a loyal citizen. Uh, that is done simply by becoming more like Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your life, which is all connected to being in that relationship with God um, and what we're being called to. For Thessalonians 4.3 says, This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Um, oh, I said before that was First Timothy 2, 3 and 4. I don't have that listed there, so... Read that. That's awesome. But what I said before was First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians, it's a tongue twister, four three. Um, his will would lead you to become. So that's how we become um, a loyal citizen. But he says even more. I want you to come in further um, in this sanctification, this discipleship process. And that I want you to be a passionate ambassador. I want you to become passionate to tell the world what he desires to choose his love about how they too could immigrate into the kingdom of God. This is the same passion Jesus had in telling us when he came and said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand in Matthew four seventeen. Not only will he put that same passion in you, but he will equip you to do this good work that he designed for you to do. Um, you will now be called to become a passionate ambassador for the kingdom of God, sent back to the kingdom of mankind with the good news of the gospel. Hebrews thirteen twenty to 21 says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought you back from the, from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This will happen from the moment you make the decision to follow Christ as your king. A decision, by the way, that is not just an emotional, momentary prayer. It might be an emotional prayer, but that's just a starting place. But it's the first step in a greater journey that requires your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And through that love, you will love your neighbor as yourself. Luke 9.23 says, Then he said to them, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. To me, that is the best salvation verse there is. Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, deny themselves, take up the cross daily, and follow me. I think this 
is a beautiful verse that really sums up going from the hostile foreigner to the broken immigrant to the loyal citizen to the passionate ambassador because that's what Jesus, the path Jesus showed us. Call it sanctification. Call it discipleship. Call it immigration into the kingdom of God. It all comes down to the, whole th to the same thing. Being imitators of Christ. So in conclusion, we have a choice to make. Not just to make Jesus our Savior. Not just to escape hell and all the brokenness that comes from the kingdom of man. Not just to, to escape the punishment of sin, which is death. But something more amazing. We have been given the power of choice. The blood of Jesus gave us the power of choice. We have a choice of what king we want to follow and what kingdom we want to belong to. This is what God wanted when he lived in relationship with Adam and Eve, walking and talking in the garden in the cool of the day. This will be the answer to the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray on the Sermon of the Mount, Matthew 6, 10, when he said, this is how you pray. Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth just like it is done in heaven. This is the coming of the kingdom of God. All right. So that is the chapter um, called The Power of Choice. And timeline, we, we're, we're, we've seen what happened in the Garden of Eden, the two, the two trees, power of the kingdom of God. But now it's usurped by the power of um, of the kingdom of man but God is starting his master plan to return us to that choice and of course we're going to see that through Jesus um, we're going to continue this next Monday we're about halfway through season 2 um, we're going to talk more about um, the hostile foreigner and, and what God was setting up as his master plan I will see you guys God bless you this is Pastor Kevin see you next week